Right. Um, I'll be talking today about sensory substitution, which means replacing one human sense by another one, uh, specifically in this case, trying to replace vision once it's lost by visual input via another sensory input, uh, be it touch or be it hearing. Uh, but before I go into that, I'd like to give a little bit of my background because I have a first life and a second life. I'll be talking about my second life, but um, my first life is that I work at a company called NXP Semiconductors uh, where we have an activity in computer vision. And certainly when we have seen the somewhat slow movements in second life, uh, there's clearly a need for te technological advance also uh, to speed up uh, the processing of visual material. And one of the products that uh, is being developed is a chip that has 320 cores running parallel, so a highly, a massively parallel processing chip that gives you, let's say, 100 billion operations per second for just a watt or something. That's a side remark. Back to my second life, um, which is sensory substitution for the blind. And you can say that it is a form of augmented reality for blind people. They may be lost their sense of sight during life, and we're trying to augment the, their experiences again with visual information and ideally visual experiences. So that's the subject of my talk. Oh, sorry. The, the switch over there, I guess. Oh. Okay, um, there are basically two different approaches to doing that sensory substitution thing. Um, you can either replace vision by tactile stimuli. Um, that's uh, what Paul Beccarita did for let's say half a century um, using a matrix of electrodes that you can put on your back or in later incarnations they use a tongue for, the, for that purpose. Or you can use human hearing to try and convey uh, a lot of visual information. You, of course, you have to do that in a special way. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, there are also connections between sensory substitution and art. Most recently, uh, there was this nice chair in the news um, uh, designed by people. I don't even know if it's functional, but it certainly looks cute with this tactile display in the back and the kind of backside of a television set uh, in the chair. You can plug a SCART connector into that and I don't know if it works, but it's a, it's, it's a cool design, the mind chair. So I'll start with discussing some of the principles of conveying images via sound and discuss some implementations. Then I'll give some examples of image sounds, discuss links with psychology, philosophy, and also neuroscience, and finally wrap up with some conclusions. Now to start with the principles, um, there are some basic facts. Of course, blind people cannot see, but usually they can hear very well. They can actually hear better than you and me, generally speaking, because they are so trained in discerning minute detail in sound. Secondly, with modern day PCs, multimedia computing allows us to convert basically anything into anything, real time. So if you combine those two facts, then a logical question is, Perhaps we can translate video into audio in a way that preserves a lot of in visual information. And what we hope then is that once you do that, that the human, human mind is flexible enough, adaptive enough to sort of do the un inverse mapping and learn to decode those complex sounds and generate some form of mental imagery from that. That's the underlying idea. Now, how do we do this mapping? Um, this is pretty much the same approach as was uh, described earlier today by Stephanie Smith from NASA. Uh, only there it was focused more on conveying curves in math and all that. You uh, sort of uh, scan an image from left to right every second or so. And while doing so, you associate height with pitch and brightness with loudness. That means that if you have a diagonal line running from the bottom left to the upper right, it sounds something like weep, 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 as it 
returns every second scanning the image. And those horizontal line segments are something like doo doo doo, doo doo doo. And if you have a block of white pixels, it will sound like a noise burst, something like tsh, tsh. And I'll show you in a second. Now, it's scanning at more real time rate. By the way, you have to trade off um, the frame rate with the effective resolution that you can achieve in sound. Um, yep, here we have it. Weep, weep, there you have the diagonal line. The short line segment, and so on. Now, an important question is, if you apply this approach, does it break down once you go to complex images? Because I'm more interested in conveying live um, scenery uh, of your local environment. And um, as a matter of fact, you can show, you can prove that it does uh, preserve a lot of information for arbitrary images. And you can do a computer reconstruction from the soundscapes that are being generated. And if you get recognizable images back, then you know that the information was still in the sounds. And then it uh, starts to become meaningful to try and train to do that with your brain instead of with the computer. So on the left side, we have a bunch of images that are the original, a low resolution, low frame rate. And on the right side of the view, we have reconstructions from their corresponding sounds as generated according to the algorithm that I outlined before. Now, as a sighted person, you have no problem whatsoever to recognize what is there in the right side images. So it's meaningful information. It's still there in the sounds. And the big question then becomes, can humans via their hearing learn to do a similar kind of decoding? As it turns out, that's not at all easy. And um, our ability to recognize things uh, deeply depends on the way things are represented. And this is an example to illustrate how representation affects your ability to recognize. In this case, we have a photograph at the uh, top right of a parked car, and I mapped it differently using brightness for height in a three-dimensional map. So you get this kind of mountainscape, which apart from, from some occlusion effects, contains the same information as the, the photograph and yet you probably cannot recognize anything in it. And thus the question is, if you would be exposed for a long time to these mountainscapes, would you then begin to be able to recognize a car and buildings in the back and all that? That's the question that we are dealing with now. So people, blind people have various options nowadays uh, for hardware. They can play with a webcam and software that's available over the internet, or if they want a somewhat more advanced setup, they can buy a video sunglasses uh, that are, well, sunglasses with a tiny camera hidden in the bridge above the nose. And I've brought one of those with me. And I just hope it will work. You need some help? No, I think it will be fine. wire tangle bringing it here but what I'll do now is first plug in uh, a power converter because the USB gives you 5 volt and these analog cameras need 9 volts or something like that so now it's powered and because the other, these are analog cameras they uh, need a an extra device to convert an analog signal, video signal, into a digital signal that the computer can handle. So that's why I plug in a video capture device. That's this, this small block over there. And if I now launch uh, the software that people can get from the internet, uh, it yes, should right. recognize the camera and start sounding its live view. that the sound changes as I look around and look at different things. There's a rhythm from the keyboard. Yeah. Anyway. 
as just to illustrate the kind of gear that is nowadays available. These are commercial products. You can buy these glasses in the United States. And uh, there are blind people walking around with these uh, this kind of uh, setups. Um, to give you some examples of image sounds that are less complex than these real life images, uh, and at the same time not entirely trivial either, I'll give a few examples. So let's start with this curved line going up and down and up, if you look from left to right. As this scan from left to right, you also hear a tone going up and down and up in pitch. And it repeats every second. Now this is pretty simple, so let's add something to this view, some rectangles or squares at the bottom left. So now you have to do do to do do and still you can hear this curve being traced. It's not lost or something. And we add a few more squares. And some more at the top right. You see? And there's no time to really, uh, um, well, I'll slow down it a bit. Um, but there's no time to really grasp this in detail. But what you will find if you uh, try this uh, at home uh, using samples that are available on the web, um, that is very hard to mentally grasp everything at the same time. Even though the soundscape is still the same, you will tend to focus on either something at the bottom left or uh, the sounds that belong to the top right. But getting it all in one view is very difficult. In a way, you have a kind of mental saccade, just like you as a sighted person look around with your eyes to quickly get an idea of what is in a space you have also mental saccades. That even for the same auditory input, you can move your attention around and get bits and pieces from the one and the same soundscape. Now here's another example of a more realistic view of a building. So we have this white blob in the middle that will give a kind of noise-like sound, and then the windows on the right side will give a rhythm. And if I look to the right, so the view turns to the left. Okay. So I'm sure this sounds miserable because with the room acoustics it's just not working that well as you can get it from headphones. So you can play around again with the software from the internet and get a somewhat better uh, result. But I hope it, it gets the idea along. Now about psychology and philosophy. Just some quotes from blind users of this technology. Um, I'll read a few parts. Uh, one is from a late blind user uh, a lady living in the United States, she said, I look across my study while using the program and see the scanning table, then the small bouquets in the back of the table with an image of the doors opening on the left of the scene. And later on she writes, wearing the scene with sound program is like stepping from total darkness into light. She has seen before, she became blind due, an, due to an accident, so she remembers very well what sight was like and has that kind of reference. Now, different blind people have different interests. Like with any set of people, you find very diverse interests. And uh, another quote from a blind man living in India is, artificial vision has given me a new sense to play with. I can experience a lot of things visually, and just knowing that contributes to my sense of well-being. So that it's a different angle. It's more, more like a fun angle. It's, it's interesting to him. Now, the link to philosophy. Um, actually, it goes back for at least three centuries when uh, there was the uh, when there arose the so-called Molyneux problem. Um, the philosopher um, John Locke had a discussion with his friend William Molyneux, and uh, they wondered: suppose that someone who was born blind would somehow miraculously regain uh, eyesight. Would such a person be able to tell a cube from a sphere just by sight alone? And their answer, they agree agreed upon, was no, no way, because such a person has never learned to decode those visual inputs. However, if you paraphrase the question in the context of sensory substitution, you get a different answer. Would someone born blind using seeing with sound be able to tell a cube from a sphere by sight alone? The answer is yes, because this mapping is so simple that you can already rationally argue what certain shapes should sound like, such as when you have the side view of a cube, a square, during the left to right scan, it will start suddenly with the left edge. Then the noise bandwidth will stay constant while the square is being scanned, and it will stop suddenly at the end of the square. 
while with a circle, it starts more gradually and stops more gradually. So this is the square. And this is the circle of the sphere. Now, of course, a good philosopher will ask, what does that mean? But since they already spent three centuries on the first question, uh, maybe they'll need another three centuries to address the second question, and we don't have time tonight to go into that. So I'll hop over to neuroscience. Uh, in the mid-90s, Taya Kulila from Finland um, discovered that when you let a, an early blind person do an auditory discrimination task, that not only the auditory cortex lights up, but also the visual cortex between quotes. Because you don't know how visual that cortex is, but anatomically it's the visual cortex, the occipital lobe. After that finding, um, lots of other researchers proceeded um, investigating this phenomenon, which is um, an example of neuroplasticity. When a certain brain region is not fed by the kind of input that it would normally have had if you were sighted, it gets kind of recruited for other purposes. So that's an example of brain plasticity, long-term development, de developmental. Um, for instance, it was later on in around 2002 found by uh, Alvaro Pascalioni of Harvard Medical School uh, that if you blindfold sighted people, volunteers for a week, that their visual cortex also becomes responsive to sound just in simple sound discrimination tasks. So if the visual cortex can in such a short period of time become responsive to sound, visually meaningless sound, the question arises, what happens if you put in visually meaningful sound? Sound that contains visual information as generated by these sensory substitution approaches. So what will happen if the voice, this technique for mapping images into sound were applied in similar experiments. Now that kind of research has been ramping up in the last few years. And for instance, as work done in, at the University of Dusseldorf in Germany, uh, where they blindfolded students for uh, three weeks and uh, they found that, well, over time, over the period of a few weeks, their ability to discriminate various types of shapes improved as compared to controls. So that's one aspect, functional behavior improved. Another finding that was published last year in, in Nature Neuroscience um, and based on uh, research done at Harvard Medical School is that um, a certain brain region that was known to be involved in shape processing, shape identification, uh, but normally responsive only to shape discrimination based on tactile input, feeling shape, or uh, seeing a shape, that region became responsive to people who were trained with this seeing with sound system. So it looks like um, this, this region does not care too much from which modality the information comes, but is rather interested in the kind of information that is in there, no matter what kind of modality. Um, this region does not, for instance, respond to uh, the sounds of a barking dog, uh, barking dog for, for example. So it looks like there are computational modules in the brain that can be rewired to other sensory inputs. Um, if I have the time, I think I can spare four minutes for a video. Okay. Uh, last month there was a broadcast on uh, Canadian television about a subject um, that was an experienced user of the voice. and uh, they So what we're going to do itself. is test you on identifying objects using the voice. Functional MRI studies show that visual as well as auditory parts of Pat's brain are activated when she uses the voice. What we want to know now is whether that activity... To find out how essential these visual areas are, Pasquale Leone plans to use TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation, a device he helped develop, to block their activity. Okay. So, Pat, I'm going to actually list out the objects that you're going to be seeing with the voice right now, and Sarah's going to hand them out to you. So the first one is a water bottle. Okay. So I'm placing the first object in front of you. To begin, Pat familiarizes herself with a series of objects by listening to their soundscapes with the voice. The next one is a spider. It's also on a white background. 
spider? Yes, it's a spider. She then successfully identifies a random selection of the same objects. Here's a perfect soundscape of the saw. You can hear the sound and then you hear the handle and the teeth. Okay, I can hear the legs in it this time. And so we are delivering pulses on the occipital pole, which is right in the back of your head. Interesting. The way we disrupt the activity is using non-invasive brain stimulation. So ways of, of inducing a, a current in the part of the brain that we are uh, targeting and applying it in such a way that it will decrease, shut down for a short period of time. But as soon as TMS is applied, her ability to identify the objects falters. Maybe the cup? Close, it was the water bottle. Water bottle? Mm-hmm. And this object is attached to a clamp. With the visual areas of her brain deactivated, Pat's ears can no longer help her to see. Maybe the giraffe? It was the seashell. It's too blurry. The wrench, maybe? Maybe the spider? It's like everything's underwater. It's all washed out. So we've learned that not only is this visual part of the brain activated, but that it's actually needed or causally related um, to the ability to use the voice. The mind, when it's exposed to it, it wants to see. It, it wants to understand what's around it. Pat's ability to see through her ears confirms what Pasquale Leone and others have long suspected about the adaptability of modules in the brain. Instead of thinking of the brain as a large part of it devoted to sight and a large part of it devoted to hearing and so forth, to think of the brain as organized in, in areas that do a certain computation. See if we can catch a steam. The voice, available free from the web, has reconnected Pat to her joy in life. <laughs> the pleasures <laughs> of learning to see again. Okay, so temporarily knocking out the visual cortex of this blind user of the voice spoils her ability to see for a short period of time. So it, it really proves that the visual cortex does get involved again. Up to what level? Well, again, that is uh, part of follow-up research to be done because vision is tremendously complex, very multifaceted. So you can't just simplify and say that this implies that there is sight as we know it. Questions, important questions that we made are, how practical will this become over time for experienced users? What can they learn to do with it? What can they not learn to do with it? Why is that? Can we understand it? Can we improve upon it via additional methods? Lots of questions that we do not have answers for yet. Um, there's also the kind of mystery of the qualia, the, the kind of experience that you have. For instance, going back to this diagonal line, you can either hear a diagonal line or see it. It's the same information, same visual information, and still there's a key difference in your experience of it. Why is that? Can we bridge that? Can we somehow make uh, the brain jump that gap, especially if you're blind and have a need to have this visual experience again, how can you get the brain to get that visual experience from that visual information encoded in sound? Um, this seems to have also links to synesthesia. Some people, otherwise normal people, uh, experience colors when they see letters or they uh, hear sounds when they see certain forms and so on and so forth, there are many possible combinations. What can we learn from them? Somehow, in their case, uh, this qualia gap is somewhat bridged. And that's the kind of thing that we would like to elaborate upon once we understand better how it all works. So to wrap up, seeing with sound is some, uh, something where research is ongoing uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, actually. There are projects going on in Europe and in the United States. It's quite afford affordable because unlike the tactile displays, for which there's no standard technology that you can buy in the shop for these matrix displays, 
with headphones, that's no issue. It's, I mean, 10 euros, 10 dollars, whatever, then you have already a fairly good uh, set of headphones. It's also non-invasive. You don't have any surgery needed for this. And it's because of the use of mass market technology already available worldwide. And anyone who wants to mo know more about it can go to this website, www.artificialvision.com, where you can also get examples of image sounds, software, and so forth to play with. Okay, I'd like to leave it at this and maybe give room for some questions or comments. Are there any questions? Um, could you do the microphone? Could you pass it around? Um, uh, the, 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 the eyepiece, does it use one camera or uh, two cameras? One camera right now, yeah. There are no similar setups commercially available that have two cameras. I'd love to have stereo uh, cameras. Yes. The software supports the use of stereo cameras, so it can take in uh, two images and from the disparity calculate the depth map and integrate that in the soundscapes. So in terms of software, it's supported, but in terms of hardware, it's still difficult to get uh, an adequate setup without having an electronics engineer nearby to, to make it work. But the experiments with that uh, have an effect on the blind people. Blind people are able to hear the, the difference between left and right in, an, in, an, in, a, in, the, in, in the two different images. Well, it hasn't been tried with stereo vision setups, so not with uh, two cameras, uh, but stereo is used in the monocular camera setup to support the perception of the left to right scanning. In, in principle, it's not needed because you can have a reference click that says, well, now starts the beginning of the next view, but perceptually it makes life easier uh, to have the supplementary stereo effect for the, the panning from left to right. Have you experimented as well with uh, depth perception? I could imagine a, a device using a scanning uh, system with infrared lasers to uh, gauge uh, depth and create, generate an image like that as well? Um, that would be very nice to experiment with, but just like with the uh, st stereo camera setups, these devices are not yet uh, available for reasonable prices. I mean, not yet at consumer prices. That, that may change as a company uh, that has announced that they will have a consumer level depth mapping camera in maybe a year from now, but we'll have to see how well that works. But. Yes, that would be very nice to, uh, to, to experiment with, at least, and to see how uh, intuitive or counterintuitive it may turn out to be. Because you can also, for instance, map the left image to the left ear and the right image to the right ear and let the brain figure it out. There are advantages to that, because if you only have a depth map, you're basically discarding everything that's far away. Well, there may be very important landmarks far away from you that you need in your, your tracking, in your navigation. So it's better to let the brain do it if the brain can do it. And I was wondering if your experienced users um, mimic the sounds that they've learned to associate with particular um, images. Like I can uh, imitate music that I hear by singing. Um, they yes, but your vocal cords are, well, a bit limited. It's very difficult to have two melodies at the same time using your vocal cords. Uh, so to some extent, perhaps, but only picking bits and pieces of a complete view that generally is very, is highly polyphonic generally. Might that be a limitation of your technique? Um, not of the technique, maybe of the brain. I don't know yet how well the brain can learn to cope with that. Polyphonic listening is not easy. It's something that you need to acquire over time. And hopefully it's uh, something like learning a second language, but uh, there's no proof of that yet. So the technology can handle it all, it's no problem to, to generate these sound and you can prove that uh, all the visual content is still there up to a certain frame rate and resolution. That's not a problem. The, the really big issues are now in what the brain can learn to do or maybe how you can assist the brain in getting to that point of uh, understanding what is in there. <laughs>